Ulysses by James Joyce, section 9. B. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Hugh McGuire. Michael Hind. Amanda Blagg. Colin Robertson. Wilson Blakey. Christine Myers. Andrew Skinner. Mike Trevino. Jean-François Rondeau. Buck Mulligan rapped John Eglinton's desk sharply. Whom do you suspect? He challenged. Say that he is spurned lover in the sonnets, once spurned, twice spurned, but the Count Wanton spurned him for a lord, his drear me love. Love that dare not speak its name. As an Englishman, you mean, John, sturdy Eglinton put in, he loved a lord. Old was... <clears throat> Old wall where sudden lizards flash. At Sherrington, I watched him. It seems so, Stephen said. When he wants to do for him and for all other and singular unheard wombs, the holy office an ostler does for the stallion, maybe, like Socrates, he had a midwife to mother as he had a shrew to wife. But she, the jiglot wanton, did break a bed vow. Two deeds are rank in a ghost mind, a broken vow in the dull-brained yokel on whom her favor has declined. Deceased husband's brother, sweet Anne, I take it, was hot in the blood, once a wooer, twice a wooer. Stephen turned boldly in his chair. The burden of proof is with you, not with me, he said, frowning. If you deny that in the fifth scene of Hamlet, he has branded her with infamy, tell me why there is no mention of her during the third four, 34 years between the day she married him and the day she buried him. All those women saw their men down and under. Mary, her good man John, and her poor dear Willem, when he went and died on her, raging that he was the first to go. Joan, her four brothers, Judith, her husband, and all her sons. Susan, her husband too, while Susan's daughter, Elizabeth, to use granddaddy's words, wed her second, having killed her first. Oh, yes, mention there is. In the years when he was living richly in royal London to pay a debt, she had to borrow forty shillings from her father's shepherd. Explain you then. Explain the swan song too, wherein he has commanded her to posterity. He faced their silence. To whom thus, Eglinton, you mean the will that has been explained, I believe, by jurist. She was entitled to her widow's dower. A common law, his legal knowledge was great, our judges tell us. Im Satan fleers, mocker. And therefore he left out her name from the first draft, but he did not leave out the presence of his granddaughter for his daughters, for his sister, for his old cronies in Stratford and in London. And therefore, when he was urged, as I believe, to name her, he has left her his second best bed. Left there is second best, best stab, second best. Left Whoa. Whoa! Pretty country folk had few chattels then, John Eglinton observed, as they have still, if our peasant plays are true to type. He was a rich country gentleman, Stephen said, with a coat of arms and a landed estate in Stratford and a house in Ireland Yard, a capitalist shareholder, a bill promoter, a tithe farmer. Why did he not leave her best... Why did he not leave her his best bed if he wished her to snore away the rest of her nights in peace? It is clear that there are two beds, a best and a second best. 
Mr. Second Best Best said finally. Sopracio Amensa et da Thalamo bettered Buck Mulligan and was smiled on. Antiquity mentions famous beds. Second Eglinton puckered, bed smiling. Let me think. Antiquity mentions that stagger right school urchin and bald heathen sage, Stephen said, who was dying in exile frees and in Tao's slaves pays tribute to his elders, wills to be laid in earth near the bones of his dead wife and bids his friends be kind to an old mistress. Don't forget Nell Gwyn Herpilis and let her live in his villa. Do you mean he died so? Mr. Bess asked with slight concern. I mean... He died dead drunk, Buck Mulligan capped. A quart of ale is a dish of a king. Oh, I must tell you what Dowden said. What? asked Best Glinton. William's Shakespeare and Company Limited, the People's William, for terms apply, E. Dowden, Highfield House. Lovely, Buck Mulligan sapired amorously. I asked him what he thought of the charge of pedestry brought against the bard. He lifted his hands and said, All we can say is that life ran very high in those days. Lovely. Catamite. The sense of beauty leads us astray, says beautiful, beautiful sadness best to ugling Englinton. Steadfast John replied severe, The doctor can tell us what those words mean. You cannot eat your cake and have it. Sayest thou so? Will thy rest from us, from me, the palm of beauty? And the sense of property, Stephen said. He drew Shylock out of his own long pocket, the son of a malt jobber and money lender. He was himself a corn jobber and money lender with ten tods of corn hoarded in the famine riots. His borrowers had no doubt those divers of warships mentioned by Chettle Falstaff who reported his uprightness of dealing. He sued a fellow player for the price of a few bags of malt and extracted his pound of flesh in interest for every money lent. How else could Aubrey's ostler and callboy get rich quick? All events brought grist to his mill. Shylock chimes with jew-baiting that followed the hanging and quartering of Queen's leech Lopez, his Jew's heart being plucked. Forth while the sheeny was yet alive, Hamlet and Macbeth, the coming to the throne of the Scotch philosopher, with a turn for which coasting the lost Amada is his jeer in love's labor lost, his pageants, his, the histories sail full-bellied on a tide of mafficking enthusiasm, Warwickshire Jesuits are tied and we have a porter's theory of equivocation, the sea venture come home from Bermudas and play Wren and admired as Written with pasty Caliban, our American cousin, the sugared sonnets follow Sidney's. As for Fay Elizabeth, otherwise Cariety Bess, the gloss, gross virgin who inspired the merry wives of Windsor, let some merry hair from Almany grope his life long for deep hid meanings in the depth of the bucket basket. I think you're getting on very nicely. Just mix up a mixture of theological philology. Philological. Mingo, Minxie, Mictum, Minger. Prove that he was a Jew, John Anglican dared expectantly. Your dean of studies holds he was a holy Roman. Suflamidus sum. He was made in Germany, Stefan replied, as the champion French polisher of Italian scandals. A myriad-minded man, Mr. Best reminded. Coleridge called him myriad-minded. Amplius... In societe humana hoc est maximum necessarium ut sit amiticum inter multos. St. Thomas, Stephen began. Ora pro nobis, Monk Mulligan groaned, sinking to a chair. There he keened a wailing rune. Pogmahon! Actuna! Macri! Et destroyed! We are from this day. It's destroyed. We are from All smile. Their smiles. St. Thomas, Stephen, smiling, said, whose gore-bellied works I enjoy reading in the original, 
writing of incest from a standpoint different from that of the new Viennese school Mr. McGee spoke of, likens, likens it in his wise and curious way to an avarice of the emotions. He means that the love so given to one near in blood is covetously withheld from some stranger who it may be hungers for it. Jews, from Christians taxed with avarice, are of, are of all races the most given to intermarriage. Accusations are made in anger. The Christian laws which built up the hordes of the Jews for whom, as for the Lollards, storm was shelter, bound their affections to with hoops of steel. Whether the, these be sins or virtues, old nobadaddy will tell us at doomsday leet. But a man who holds so tightly to what he calls his rights over what he calls his debts will hold tightly also to what he calls his rights over her whom he calls his wife. No, sir, smile neighbors shall covet his ox or his wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his jackass. Or his Jenny ass, Buck Mulligan antiphoned. Gentle will is being roughly handled, gentle Mr. Best said gently. Which will, gag sweetly Buck Mulligan, we are getting mixed. The will to live, John Eglinton philosophized, for poor Anne, Will's widow, is the will to die. Requesiet, Stephen prayed. What of all the will to do? It has vanished long ago. She lies laid out in stark stiffness in that second best bed, the mobbled queen, even though you prove that a bed in those days was as rare as a motor car is now and that its carvings were the wonder of seven parishes. In old age, she takes up with gospelers. One stayed at New Place and drank a quart of sack the town paid for, but in which bed he slept it skills not to be asked. And heard she had a soul. She read or had read to her chapbooks, referring, preferring them to merry wives and losing her nightly waters on the Jordan. She thought over hooks and eyes for believers' breeches and the most spiritual snuff-box to make up the most devout soul's sneeze. Venus had twisted her lips in prayer. Agonbite of inwit, remorse of conscience. It is an age of exhausted whoredom, groping for its god. History shows that to be true. <clears throat> inquit. Eglintonus chronologus. The ages succeed one another. But we have it on high authority that a man's worst enemies shall be those of his own house and family. I feel that Russell is right. What do we care for his wife and father? I would say that if only family poets have family lives, Falstaff was not a family man. I feel that the fat king is a supreme creation. Lean, he lay back. Shy, deny thy kindred, the uncle gid. Shy, supping with the goddess, he sneaks the cup. A sire in Oltonian Antrim bade it, bade it him. Visits him here on quarter days. Mr. McGee, sir, there's a gentleman here to see you. Me? Says he's your father, sir. Give me my words worth. Enter McGee, more Matthew, a rugged, rough, rug-headed kern in strossers with a buttoned codpiece, his nether stocks bemired with a clobber of ten forests, a wand of wielding in his hand. Your own? He knows your old fellow, the widower. Hurrying to her squalid death lair from gay Paris on a quayside, I touched his hand. The voice, new warmth, speaking. Dr. Bob Kenny is attending her. The eyes that wish me well, but do not know me. A father, father Stephen said, said battling, battling against, against hopelessness, hopelessness is a necessary evil. evil. He wrote the play in the months that followed his father's death. If you hold that he, a graying man with two marriageable daughters with 35 years of life, nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, with 50 of experience is the beardless undergraduate from Wittenberg, then you must hold that a seven-year-old seven -year -old mother is a lustful queen. No. The corpse of John Shakespeare does not walk the night. From hour to hour, it rots and rots. He rests, disarmed of fatherhood, having devised a mystical estate upon his son. Boccaccio Calendrino was the first and last man who felt himself with child. 
Fatherhood, in the sense of conscious begetting, is unknown to man. It is a mystical estate, an apostolic succession, from only begetter to only begotten. On, on that, that mystery, mystery, and not on the Madonna, Madonna, which the cunning Italian intellect flung to the mob of Europe, the Church is founded and founded ir irremovably, because founded, like the world, macro and microcosm, upon the void, upon incertitude, upon unlikelihood, amor matris, subjective and objective genitive, may be the only true thing in life. Paternity may be a legal fiction. Who is the father of any son, that any son should love him, or he any son? What, what the, the hell, hell are, are you driving, driving at? at? I know, shut up. Blast you. I have reasons. Amplius adduc eternum postea. Are you condemned to this? There are southern by a bodily shame so steadfast that the criminal annals of the world, stained with all other incest and bestialities, hardly record his breach. Sons with mothers, sires with daughters, lesbic sisters, loves, loves that, that dare not speak their name. Nephews with grandmothers, jailbirds with keyholes, queens with prize bulls. The son unborn, Mars beauty born, he brings pain, divides affection, increases care, he is male. His growth is his father's decline, his youth his father's envy, his friends his father's enemy. En rue, Monsieur le Prince, I thought it. What links them in nature, an instant of blind rut? Am I father, if I were? Shrunken, uncertain hand. Sibelius, the African, subtlest hierarchy of all the beasts of the field, held that the father was himself his own son. The bulldog of Equin, with whom no word shall be impossible, refutes him. Well, if the father who is not a son be not a father, can the son who is not a father be a son? When Rutland Bacon Southam Shakespeare or another poet of the same name in the comely of errors wrote Hamlet he was not the father of his own son merely but being no more a son he was and felt himself the father of all his race the father of his own grandfather the father of his unborn grandson who by the same token never was born for nature as Mr. McGee understands her abhors perfection. Eglinton eyes, quick with pleasure, looked up shy brightly, gladly glancing a merry Puritan through the twisted Eglantine. Flatter. Rarely, but flatter. Himself his own father, son Mulligan told himself. Wait, I am big with child. I have an unborn child in my brain. Pallas Athena, a play. The play's the thing. Let me parturiate. Clasped at his paunch brow with both birth aiding hands. As for his family, Stephen said, his mother's name lives in the forest of Arden. Her death brought from him the scene with Volumnia in Corianus. His boy son's death is the destine of young Arthur in King John. Hamlet the Black Prince. Is Hamnet Shakespeare? Who the girls in The Tempest? In the pericles, in winter's tale, are we know. Who Cleopatra, flesh pot of Egypt, and Cressid and Venus are, we may guess. But there is another member of his family who is recorded. The plot thickens, John Eglinton said. The Quaker librarian, quaking, tiptoed in, quake, his mask, quake, with haste, quake, quack. Door closed. Cell. Day. They list three they. I, you, he, they. Come. Yes. He had three brothers, Gilbert, Edmund, Richard. Gilbert, in his old age, told some cavaliers he got a pass for nout, for Maester Gatherer. One time mass he did, and he seen his bird, Maester Wool the Playwriter. Up in London, in a wrestling play, with a man on back. The playhouse sausage filled Gilbert's soul. He's nowhere, but an Edmund and a Richard are recorded in the works of Sweet William. Names. What's in a name? Best. That is my name, Richard, don't you know? I hope you're going 
to say a good word for Richard. Don't you know? For my sake. <laughs> Buck Mulligan. Piano. Dimiwendo. Then outspoke medical Dick to his comrade medical Davy. Stephen. In his trinity of black wills, the villain Shakebags, Iago, Richard Crookback, Edmund King Lear, to bear the wicked uncle's names. Nay, that last play was written or being written while his brother Edmund lay dying in S Southwark. Best. I hope Edmund is going to catch it. I don't want Richard. My name. <laughs> Quaker lies here. A temple. But he that filches from me, my good name. Stephen. Srigendo. He has hidden his own name, a fair name, William, in the plays, a superhero, a clown there, as a painter of old Italy set his face in a dark corner of his canvas. He has revealed it in the sonnets where there is will in overplus. Like John O'Gaunt, his name's dear to him, as dear as the coat of arms he toadied for. On a bend sable a spear or steeled argent. Honor ficca billeted in habitus. Dearer than his glory of greatest shake scene in the country. What's in a name? That is what we ask ourselves in childhood when we write the name that we are told is ours. A star, a day star, a fire drake rose at its birth. It shone by day in the heavens alone, brighter than Venus in the night, and by night it shone over Delta in Cassiopeia, the recumbent constellation which is the signature of his initial among the stars. His eyes watched it, low-lying on the horizon, eastward of the bear, as he walked by the slumberous sumber fields at midnight, returning from Chaudhary and from her arms. Both satisfied, I, too. Don't tell them he was nine years old when it was quenched. And from her arms? Wait to be wooed and won. I, Meacock, who will woo you? Read the skies. Otto Mitter Munoz, Bose Stephanomos, where's your configuration, Stephen? Stephen, cut the bread even. S D Sua Donna Gia di Lui Gelindo Risolve di Non Amar S D. What is that, Mister Dedalus? The Quaker librarian asked. Was it a celestial phenomenon? A star by night. Stephen said. A pillar of the cloud by day. What's more to speak? Stephen looked at his hat, his stick, his boots. Stephanos, my crown, my sword. His boots are sporting the shape of my feet. Buy a pair. Holes in my socks. Handkerchief, too. You make good use of the name, John Eglinton allowed. Your own name is strange enough. I suppose it explains your fantastical humor. Me, McGee, and Mulligan. Fabulous artificer, uh, the hawk-like man you flew, where to? New Haven, Dieppe, steerage, passenger, Paris and back, Lauping, Icarus, Pater, Ait, sea bedabbled, fallen, weltering, lau lapwing you are, lapwing be. Mr. Best eager quietly lifted his book to say. That's very interesting, because that brother motive, don't you know, we find also in the old Irish myths. Just what you say, the three brothers Shakespeare. In Grimm, too, don't you know, the fairy tales. The third brother that marries the sleeping beauty and wins the best prize. Best of best brothers, good, better, best. The Quaker librarian spring halted near. I should like to know, he said, which bother you. I understand you to suggest there was, a, there was misconduct with one of the brothers. But perhaps I am anticipating? He caught himself in the act, looked at all. Refrained. An attendant from the doorway called, Mr. Leister, Father Deneen wants... Oh, Father Deneen, directly. Swiftly, rectly, creaking, rectly, rectly, he was rectly gone. John Eglinton touched the foil. Come, he said, let us hear what you have to say of Richard and Edmund. You kept them for the last, didn't you? In asking you to remember those two noble kinsmen, Nuncle Richie and Nuncle Edmund... Stephen answered. I feel I'm asking too much, perhaps. A brother is as easily forgotten as uh, an umbrella. Lapwing. Where is your brother? 
Apothecary's Hall, my whetstone. Him, then Cranley, Mulligan, now these. Speech, speech, but act. Act speech. They mock to try you. Act, be acted on. Lap wing. I'm tired of my voice. The voice of Esau. My kingdom for a drink. On. You will say those names were already in the chronicles from which he took the stuff of his plays. Why did he take them rather than others? Richard, a whore's son, crookback, misbegotten, makes love to a widowed Anne. What's in a name? Woos and wins her. A whore son, merry widow, Richard the Conqueror, third brother, came from William the Conquered. The other four acts of that play hang limply from that first. Of all his kings, Richard is the only king unshielded by Shakespeare's reverence, the angel of the world. Why is the underplot of King Lear in which Edmund figures lifted out of Sidney's Arcadia and spatchcocked on to the Celtic legend other than history, older than history? That was Will's way, John Eglinton defended. We should not now combine a Norse saga with an excerpt from a novel by George Meredith. Que voulez-vous? Moore would say. He puts Bohemia on a sea coast and makes Ulysses quote Aristotle. Why? Stephen answered himself. Because the theme of the false or the, uh, or the usurping or the adulterous brother of or all three in one is to Shakespeare what the poor is not, always with him. The note of banishment Banishment from the heart, banishment from the home, sounds uninterruptedly from the two gentlemen of Verona onward till Prospero breaks his staff, buries it certain fathoms in the earth, and drowns his book. It doubles itself in the middle of his life, reflects itself in another, repeats itself, protasis, epitasis, catastasis, catastrophe repeats itself again when he is near the grave, when his married daughter Susan, chip of the old block, is accused of adultery. But it was the original sin that darkened his understanding, weakened his will, and left in him a strong inclination to evil. The words are those of my lord's bishops of Maynooth and original sin and, like original sin, committed by another in whose sin he too has sinned. It is between the lines of his last written words, it is petrified on his tombstone, under which her four bones are not to be laid. Age has not withered it. Beauty and peace have not done it away. It is an infinite variety everywhere in the world he has created. In Much Ado About Nothing, twice in As You Like It, in The Tempest, in Hamlet, in Measure for Measure, and in all the other plays which I have not read. He laughed to free his mind from his mind's bondage. Judge Eglinton summed up. The truth is midway, he affirmed. He is the ghost and the prince. He is all in all. He is, Stephen said. The boy of Act I is the mature man of Act V. All in all. In Cymbeline, in Othello, he is bawd and cuckled. He acts and is acted on. Lover of an ideal or a perversion. Like Jose, he kills the real Carmen. His unremitting intellect is the horn-mad Iago, ceaselessly willing that the moor in him shall suffer. Cuckoo! Cuckoo! Cuck Mulligan clucked lewdly. A word of fear. Dark dome received. Reverbed. And, and what a character is Iago, undaunted John Ingleton exclaimed. When all is said, Dumas fils, or is it Dumas père, is right. After God, Shakespeare is created most. Man delights him not, nor woman neither, woman, Stephen said. He returns after a life of absence to that spot of earth where he was born, where he has always been, man and boy, a silent witness, and there, his journey of life ended, he plants his mulberry tree in the earth, then dies. The motion is ended. Gravediggers bury Hamlet père and Hamlet fille, a king and a prince at last in death, with incidental music. And what, though murdered and betrayed, be wept by all frail tender hearts for, Dane or Dubliner, sorrow for the dead is the only husband for whom they refuse to be divorced. If you like the epilogue, look long on it. Prosperous, Prospero, the good man rewarded, Lizzie, Grandpa's lump of love, and Uncle Richie, 
the bad man taken off by poetic justice to a place where the bad niggers go. Strong curtain. He found in the world without as actual what was in his world within as possible. Maeterlinck says, if Socrates leave his house today, he will find the sage seated on his doorstep. If Judas go forth tonight, it is to Judas his steps will tend. Every life is many days, day after day. We walk through ourselves, meeting robbers, ghosts, giants, old men, young men, wives, widows, brothers in love. But always meeting ourselves. The playwright who wrote the folio of this world, and wrote it badly, he gave us light first and then the sun two days later, the lord of things as they are, whom the best, whom the most Roman of Catholics call Dio Boea, hangman god, is doubtless all in all of us, in all <laughs> of us, ostler and butcher, and would be bawd and cuckold too. But that in the economy of heaven, foretold by Hamlet, there are no more marriages, glorified man, an androgynous angel, being a wife unto himself. Eureka! Eureka. Buck Mulligan cried. Eureka. Eureka! Suddenly happy, he jumped up and reached in a stride John Engleton's desk. May I, he said. The Lord has spoken to Malachi. He began to scribble on a slip of paper. Take some slips from the counter going out. Those who are married, Mr. Best, thus Harold said, all save one shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. He laughed. Unmarried at Eglinton Johannes, of arts a bachelor. Unwed, unfancied, where of wiles they finger ponder nightly each his verorium edition of the taming of the shrew. You are a delusion, said Rowley, John Eglinton Stephen. You have brought us all this way to show us a French triangle. Do you believe your own theory? No. Stephen said promptly. Are you going to write it? Mr. Best asked. You ought to make it a dialogue, don't you know? Like the platonic dialogues, Wild Road. John Eclicton doubly smiled. Well, in that case, he said, I don't see why you should expect payment for it since you don't believe it yourself. Dowden believes there is some mystery in Hamlet, but we'll say no more. Air Blebru, the man Piper, sent, uh, Piper met in Berlin, who is working up that Rutland theory, believes that the secret is hidden in the Stratford Monument. He's going to visit the present duke, Piper says, and prove to him that his ancestor wrote the plays. It will come as a surprise to his grace, but he believes his theory. I believe, O oh Lord. Help my unbelief. That is, help me to believe or help me to unbelieve. Who helps to believe? Hugo men, who to unbelieve? Other chap? You are the only contributor to Dana who asks for pieces of silver. Then I don't know about the next number. Fred Ryan wants space for an article on economics. Fred Dream, two pieces of silver he lent me. Tied you over. Economics. For a guinea, Stephen said. You can publish this interview. Buck Mulligan stood up from his laughing scribbling, laughing, and then gravely said, Honeying malice. I called upon the bard Kinch at his summer residence in Upper Mecklenburg Street, and found him deep in the study of the Summa Contra Gentilis, in the company of two gonorrheal ladies, French Nelly and Rosalie, the Colque whore. He broke away. Come, Kinch, come, wandering, Angus, of the birds. Come, Kinch, you've eaten all we left. I, I will serve you your orts and offals. Stephen rose. Life is many days. This will end. We shall see you tonight, John Anglican said. Notre ami Moul says Malachi Mulligan must be there. Buck Mulligan flaunted his slip in Panama. Monsieur Moore, he said, lecturer on French letters to the youth of Ireland. I'll be there. Come, Kinch, the bards must drink. Can you walk straight? Laughing he. Swill till eleven. Irish night's entertainment. <laughs> lover. Stephen followed a lover. One day in the National Library, we had a discussion. Shakes. After his love back, I followed. I got his guy. Stephen, greeting. Then all a mort followed a lover jester, a well-kempt head, new barbered, out of the vaulted cell into a shattering daylight of no thoughts. What have I learned? Of them? Of me? Walk like Haynes now. The constant reader's room, in the reader's book. Kasha, Boyle, O'Connor, Fitzmorse. Tisdale, Pharaoh, paraphs his polysyllables. Item, 
Was Hamlet mad? The Quakers paid God Lily with a pristine in-book talk. Oh, please do, sir. I shall be most pleased. Amused Buck Mulligan mused in pleasant murmur with himself, self-nodding. A pleased bottom. The turnstile. Is that... Blue ribboned hat, idly writing. What? Looked. The curving balustrade, smooth sliding minkus. Puck mulligan. Panamella hemated. Went step by step, iambing, trolling. John Engleton, my Joe John. Why won't you wed a wife? He sputtered to the air. Oh, the chinless Chinaman. Chin chong eglin ton. He went over to their play box, Haynes and I. The plumber's hall. Our players are creating a new art for Europe, like the Greeks or M. Matterlink. Abbey Theatre. I smell the public sweat of monks. He spat blank. Forgot any more than he forgot the whipping lousy Lucy gave him and left the femme de trente ans. And why no other children born and his first child the girl? After wit, go back. The doer, recluse, still there. He has his cake. And the douse, a youngling, minion of pleasure, Fado's toyable fair hair. Hey, I just uh, I wanted, I, I forgot. He, uh... <laughs> Longworthy and McCurdy Ackerson was there. Puck Mulligan, footed, feedling, trilling. I hardly, hardly hear, hear the purely, purely cry. cry. Or, or tell me talk, talk as I pass, I pass one by, by before, before my thoughts begin to run on F. McCurdy Atkinson, the same that had the wooden leg and that filibustering filibeg that never dared to sack his druth. McGee that had the chinless mouth, being afraid to marry on earth, they masturbated for all they were worth. Just on, know thyself. Halted below me, a quizzer looks at me, I halt. Mournful murmur, Buck Mulligan moaned. Singe is left off wearing black to be like nature. Only crows, priests, and English coal are black. A laugh tripped, tripped his over his lips. lips. Longworth is awfully sick, he said. After what you wrote about the old hate, Gregory. Oh, you inquisitionish, <laughs> inquisitionish. Jew Jesuit, inquisitional drunken Jew Jesuit. She gets you a job on the paper and then you go and Slater drivel to Jesus. Couldn't you do the Yeats touch? He went on and down, moping, chanting, with waving graceful arms. The most beautiful book that has come out of our country in my time, one thinks Homer. He stopped at the stairfoot. I have conceived a play for the murmurs, he said solemnly. The pillared Moorish hall, shadows entwine. Gone the nine men's morse with caps of indices. In sweetly varying voices, Muck, Buck Mulligan read his tablet. Every man, his own wife, or a honeymoon in the hand. He turned her happy patch smirked, smirked to Stephen. Stephen. Saying, saying the disguise I fear I fear is thin, thin but, but listen listen you read you read Marcato, Marcato. Characters. characters Toby Tostoff Toby Tostoff Pole, Pole. Crab a Bush Ranger Crab a Bush Ranger Medical Dick and Medical Davy Two birds with one medical stone. Dick and medical Davy. Mother Grogan. Two birds with one stone. A water carrier. Fresh Mother Nelly Grogan, and Rosalie. Water carrier. The cold clay whore. Fresh Nelly and Rosalie. He laughed. The cold clay whore. Lolling a to and fro head. Walking on, followed by Stephen. And mirthfully he told the shadows, souls of men. Oh, the night in the Camden Hall when the daughters of Aaron had to lift their skirts to step over you as you lay... In your mully, mulberry-colored, multicolored, multitudinous vomit. The most innocent son of Aaron, Stephen said, for whom they ever lifted them. About to pass through the doorway, feeling one behind, he stood aside. Part. The moment is now. Where, then, if Socrates leave his home today, if Judas go forth tonight? Why? Why? That lies in space, which in which I in time must come to, 
inequitably. My will, his will that fronts me, sees between. A man passed out between them, bowing, greeting. Good day again. Good day, Buck Mulligan said. The portico. We are watch the birds for angry. Angus of the birds. They go, they come. Last night I flew, easily flew. Men wandered, street of harlots after. A cream fruit melon he held to me. In, you will see. The, the wandering, wandering Jew. The wandering Jew. Buck Mulligan Buck whispered. Buck Mulligan whispered. With clowns awe. With Did clowns awe. Did you see his he eye? He looked upon to lust. He looked upon to lust. After you. After you. I fear, I fear thee, the ancient mariner. I fear the ancient mariner. thou art in peril. Oh, Kinch, thou art in peril. Get, Get thee a breech pad. Manor of Oxenford. Manor of Oxenford. Day, Day. We, wheelbarrow, sun over arch of bridge. Sun over arch of bridge. A dark Step back, back went before them. Step of a card down. Step of a card down. Step of a card down. Under the portcullis bars. They follow. They follow. Offend me still. Speak on. Speak on. Kind Offend me still. Speak on. They find the coins of houses and kill their street. No birds. No birds. Frail from the house tops, two plumes of smoke ascended. Pluming. And in a flaw of softness, softly were blown. They followed. Cease to strive. Cease to strive. Peace, Peace of the Druid priests. priests. Peace of the Druid priests. Of Cymbeline. Of Cymbeline. Do from wide earth an altar. Land Loud, lodges, we lodges, lodges, and let, let our, our crooked smokes climb to their, their nostrils. nostrils. From our blessed altars! End of section 9 of Ulysses by James Joyce. Yay! Jeez, that was creepy. To forging.